And I'd like to thank you all for coming. I hope you've all been having a great ELC. I know this is the, the last talk on the last day, so um, I promise you it's, this, is probably not, this talk is probably not going to go over time or anything like that. Uh, I'll try to keep things short and sweet, and we can talk about you know, whatever you want towards the end here. Uh, so a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Scott Garman. I, am, I work at Intel's Open Source Technology Center. Uh, I've been working on the Octo project as a software engineer for the last, I guess I started about three and a half years ago there. Uh, and then more recently, this uh, MinnowBoard project has come out. The MinnowBoard is one of the first uh, open hardware platforms that has an Intel Atom processor on it. And I'm acting basically as a technical evangelist for the Minnow Board. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Minnow Board because that's kind of what drives this, uh, this demo here and one of the reasons that I've been doing it. Uh, and then uh, in other areas, I live in Portland, Oregon in the U.S. And uh, Portland's known for being a very kind of uh, bike culture uh, kind of city in the U.S., which uh, maybe to folks in Europe is not quite a big deal, but uh, it is nice to, to live in a city in, in the U.S. that is fairly friendly to uh, bicycling, getting around transportation by bike. So. Um, I'm kind of in the maker thing. I, I have a background that I started off in college as an electrical engineering major and then switched over to computer science actually when I discovered Linux and the open source movement uh, really kind of motivated me. But I do have a little bit of a background in EE and I still like playing around with things, soldering stuff up, breadboarding, little prototypes and hacking robot kits. So uh, another thing people who know me will tell you is that I have a slight obsession that some of us in the geek community have with puns. Uh, and so, uh, especially when it comes to fish puns, if you can think of any good ones, be sure to let me know. That works well, given that most, uh, you know, this is, in, at least in, in, in the UK, you know, I wouldn't necessarily try that uh, if I was giving the talk in Asia someplace, you know, because the translation doesn't always come through. Uh, so this isn't going to be a big sales pitch about the Minnow Board, but I do want to tell people about what it is, make sure there's some awareness about it, because again, this is one of the motivations uh, behind doing this project. Uh, so uh, the Minnow board was basically designed as a platform for uh, the Octo project, as a matter of fact. Um, we wanted an open hardware and a fairly affordable platform that people that could use for Octo project development. Uh, being from Intel, we wanted it to be based on the Intel Atom processor. Uh, and we worked with a third-party company, CircuitCo, which uh, many of you may know is uh, the manufacturer of the Beagle board and the BeagleBone, uh, and some of those other kind of successful community-oriented boards. So we saw a good fit working with them to develop this kind of board, which is kind of like our version of that. Uh, we want the Minnow board to be kind of a, a successful community board with a, a healthy open source community. And one of my roles as technical evangelist is to try to kind of develop that community to kind of foster it and, uh, and get people excited about this. So uh, the Minnow board was designed, we like to say, with uh, performance, flexibility, openness, and standards uh, in mind. And so, like I said, it's, it's the first open hardware Atom platform. And uh, it's a pretty exciting time to be at Intel now because uh, the whole concept of, of open hardware and having the schematics, the design files, and everything available for um, embedded system boards is something that you know, I, I finally see as being embraced. Uh, some of you may have heard about the announcement of Galileo, which is a new, uh, kind of like an Arduino on steroids. It's got a, the, the new Quark processor in it. Uh, and that is also going to be an open hardware platform. You'll be able to get all the design files available for that. So uh, I'm seeing a little bit of a paradigm shift within Intel and embracing these things. And I think that's a great thing. And it's uh, something I'm pretty excited to be a part of. Uh, Spec-wise, the, uh, the middle board has a gigahertz CPU. Uh, it's based on uh, the Tunnel Creek processor. Uh, it has a gigabyte of RAM. Uh, it is a single core system, uh, but it has hyper-threading, so for some multi-threaded applications it'll act as if it's a two-core system. Uh, and one of the things that's unique about the Minnow board is it's got really strong I.O. performance. So we've got PCI Express on this board uh, that gives us good I.O. Uh, capabilities. So we've got SATA on it, we've got uh, full gigabit Ethernet as opposed to t you know, tying a 10100 NIC to a USB line. Um, we've tried to make this board kind of straddle some different markets. Um, I think it's going to be very popular in the professional kind of like embedded product development market because of that open hardware nature of it and the fact that it's one of the more affordable uh, Atom platforms you can get today. Uh, but we also did some things with the Minnow board like adding some GPIO buttons and LEDs and things so that you could take the thing right out of the box and immediately start, to start working on it, hacking on it and, and interacting with it. Uh, and it has a, kind of an expansion capability so that you can add on these, uh, we call them minnow board lures, which are these add-on expansion boards to add other capabilities to it too. 
So we like to say that the board is friendly to hobbyists. It's not as cheap as some of the other options out there, but uh, it, it, it's friendly to hobbyists, but it also scales up to kind of more serious embedded workloads. Uh, and I see a, a, a role for this board in areas where you need additional processing performance, you need that IO throughput uh, capability. Um, and there are many people who are getting into embedded development nowadays. It's becoming more and more common. It used to be kind of like a niche thing that people were doing. I feel like uh, other platforms like the Raspberry Pi have really enabled uh, more people to get into this embedded community. And uh, you know, people are going to want to have plenty of options. So this is one of those options that fits in to that. Uh, the middle board has uh, various embedded I.O. So you, you know, if you're used to things like SPI bus, I squared C, GPIO lines, uh, and even controller area network support is on the middle board. Uh, the board is 10.7 uh, centimeters square. Uh, the MSRP is 189 US dollars. Uh, if you want to buy it in Europe, uh, I, our two main distributors in Europe are Farnell and uh, Tigel, which I think is based in Austria. Uh, and we ship it with the Angstrom Linux distribution, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, the nice thing about Angstrom is that it's a binary distribution. You can install binary packages using a package manager online and everything. Uh, but it's also uh, a distro that's Yocto Project compatible, and that helps us to continue our message with getting people involved, potentially in using the Yocto Project on this as well. So that's my little pitch about the Minnow Board. You can learn more at our website, minnowboard.org. And uh, I heard some rumors that uh, there might be some minnow boards uh, that would be available at the last session of the day. So you might want to show up at the, the last session. Uh, I think there are going to be a few of them given away. There's going to be a little, little contest. So, so uh, let's talk about the robot arm itself. So this, this project is the minnow board, uh, I call it the minnow board fish picker upper. And uh, the purpose of, of this project was I wanted to create a demo that uh, uses the minnow board and does something that's kind of fun and kind of like maker oriented uh, type of thing. And I wanted to specifically take a technology that a lot of people find intimidating, which in this case is computer vision and object detection, um, and see how simple I could make it. See if I could make it into a project that a family could do with their kids over the course of a weekend. Uh, and I wanted to make it as affordable as possible. I wanted the, uh, the robot arm, I wanted to keep that as, as cheap as possible and that ended up uh, driving some compromises I had to make. This robot arm doesn't have any servo motors in it, for example. Uh, and I wanted to uh, you know, specifically make use of, of OpenCV because it's a pretty well-known uh, computer vision library. Uh, so the way this works, you can see the robot arm right here. And uh, what I've done is, is this is the OWI robot arm. You can buy it on Amazon, at least in the States. Uh, and it is a very affordable uh, robot arm. Oh, look at that. Um, ha it's, uh, I think it's a, around $40 or $50 and it's a kit, so you can put it together, you can see how the motors and everything are, are set up in it. Um, and uh, for another $20 or $25, you can buy a little USB control module, so you can control it uh, via uh, basically a USB serial uh, to kind of interface. I think by default it comes with a joystick control, but if you want to do computer automated control over it, you want that additional board for it too. Uh, the next thing I did was I took just a standard Logitech USB web camera and I mounted it to the base of the robot. So this thing is kind of looking out as the robot kind of rotates around and uh, we're going to make use of that. And I wanted to uh, basically have this robot arm uh, pick up a small object. I have a, a nice spongy foam, I call it a foam fish, it's kind of in the shape of a, a fish, I didn't bring it with me. Um, and it can identify this object, pick it up and then move it over to like a dinner plate or something like that. So uh, that's, that's the, the summary of the, the minnow board uh, fish picker upper. So uh, there were some challenges with the approach that I initially wanted to take with it. Uh, I've, at first I was being a little bit more ambitious. I wanted to mount the web camera to the top of the robot arm so I could try to maybe get some three dimensional control and have it kind of zero in on the object it's trying to pick up. Uh, but there were a couple of challenges with that. One of them is that the field of view on the camera wasn't that great. And the other is just that this, because it's such a cheap robot arm, I think uh, the, the heaviness, the, the weight of the camera itself is, is, is pretty strong. So you'd have to go to something more specialty, like a little mini camera or something like that on there if you wanted to, to give that a try. And that would have added more expense and complexity to it. So rather than um, putting the, uh, the camera on those the kind of jaws up here, uh, I said, okay, let's try to uh, constrain things a little bit more. What we'll do is we'll just put the camera down here on the base 
and we'll just um, use the computer vision to control the one, one degree of freedom, the kind of the rotation of the base as it zeroes in. And then the reaching down and the picking up of the, uh, the, fi the fish object would have to be like a canned routine. Uh, the other thing is um, the lack of servo motors here. Uh, can anybody tell me what the difference is between just a, a plain DC motor and a servo motor? Yes? Right, exactly. So you get, you get some feedback from servo motors. You can figure out where it is in its range of motion. Uh, and this robot arm does not have servo motors. It just has a plain DC motor. So when I'm controlling it, I'm basically issuing commands to say, rotate this motor in this direction for, and, and you know, sleep for a second or something like that, and then you know, wake it up and stop it. Um, so that, what, what that means is that the, uh, I, can't, I can't figure out really if there's, um, if, if the, the motor, if the uh, arm is, is moving in one direction, it's hit its limits and it's kind of like, you know, um, grinding through the motor. So you have to be careful to, to do that. So I try to model that in software. I say, I know I have so many seconds of, of range of motion, but it's not even that simple because uh, then you get into the situation where if I make a number of, of movements in one direction and then back, it's not it, it, the, uh, the steps that it's, it's going through. Or it, it, it doesn't put you back into the exact same situation if you're moving back and forth. So there's some slop in those, those motors too. Uh, so that provided some challenges I had to deal with as well. Uh, the other thing is I ended up using uh, OpenCV's uh, HAR uh, wavelet-based object detection. And that is not an exact science. It's, uh, there are some difficulties, especially if there are different lighting conditions that the robot is in. Uh, I will get either more or less accurate uh, object detection, and sometimes I'll have to tweak some of the parameters uh, to get that to work just right. So um, plenty of challenges involved in this, and uh, I tried to do the best I can to, to work around them. Uh, one of those uh, challenges, too, that I didn't mention was the fact that this base uh, has a bunch of uh, D-cell batteries in it, and I also knew that I didn't want to run this off of batteries because the motion, uh, again, would be dependent on how, you know, how healthy the batteries are. So one of the first things I did was I, uh, I modified the base. I drilled some holes in it, and I'm making use of some uh, power supplies. And uh, unfortunately, these power supplies are not very friendly, even using um, a power converter uh, with the, uh, the power outlets out here. And I found that I couldn't get this working. Otherwise, this would have been in the uh, Yocto Project booth uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, but basically, so, you know, I have a couple of three-volt power supplies that uh, are powering this, and this uh, allows uh, the, the robot arm to work consistently uh, given that, that power source. This here is a uh, close-up of the, uh, the robot space where I've got the web camera mounted. I basically just uh, took some double-sided tape and taped it down. It's pretty securely attached to the, the base. And so, the, you know, that, that summarizes some of the, the modifications I made to the actual robot, uh, OWI robot kit itself. So uh, OpenCV, how many people in here have worked with OpenCV before? Okay, so a number of you, it sounds like uh, most of you, though, are probably new to it. Um, so basically what OpenCV is, it's the most popular computer vision library you can get that's open source. Um, it's a BSD licensed library. It actually was started by Intel in 1999, although I believe it's maintained currently by a different organization. Uh, and there's a lot to it. So there's a lot more than just object detection uh, in OpenCV. There are something like 2,500 algorithms uh, that can do all sorts of things, motion tracking, complex image processing, taking the negative of images, filtering things out by color, um, all sorts of stuff you can do with, uh, with OpenCV. Uh, and it's a cross-platform library, so you can work with it in a number of languages like C, C++, uh, Python, Java, I think even Lisp. I'm not sure about that, but I think I read about that too. So uh, the object detection uh, system, basically, how, how does it work? How do we train a computer to recognize an object? So um, OpenCV has a couple of different algorithms you can use to do this object detection, but I'm using what's called HAR classifiers. And the way it works is basically we feed this uh, computer learning program a set of images that include the object that we're trying to detect, and those are our positive images. Uh, and then we have a bunch of basically false negative images or, or images that don't have the object that we're trying to detect. We feed it into this kind of machine learning algorithm, and it basically you know, 
gets trained. It, it learns to identify what are the similarities between a lot of these, these uh, pictures that, that have the object we're trying to detect and make sure that it's not giving false positives in the, the pictures that it knows doesn't have the object. Uh, and it does this through this, uh, this HAR classifier system. Uh, and the nice thing about HAR classifiers is that they're computationally efficient. And what they do, um, I'm, I'm probably not going to explain it very well. I do have a little YouTube video that I can show you that kind of goes into a little bit more detail. But in an overgeneralized way, HAR classifiers are a series of tests that you make against the, uh, a picture that you're trying to figure out if it has an object in it. And the first initial test you run, you do it in a series will give you very accurate information if it knows for certain the object is not in the picture. And so if you run these computationally efficient um, classifier levels, uh, you can immediately kind of rule out certain images if it doesn't have it. But if it thinks, okay, it, it might have it in it, then you go on to the next kind of more computationally intensive test to determine if the object is in the image. Uh, and then it, it keeps going down, down the, the chain until it gets to the more seriously computationally intensive ones that give you a much more accurate view of whether that object exists there. So to train uh, a hard classifier, you have to start with fairly large sets, and it's recommended that, you know, 100 or more images of the object that you're trying to detect uh, to make sure that there's plenty of data for it to work with. Uh, and in addition, it's, it's unfortunately, it's not as simple as just taking the photo and feeding it into these, uh, this, this machine lear learning algorithm. You have to help it out a little bit. You have to mark out with a box this region of interest that shows where that object is within those pictures. Uh, and there's a utility for doing this to help you out doing this called Object Marker. And I'll give you a quick demo of that. Uh, and that will uh, I'll give you an idea of, of the process that you have to go through. Uh, and then there are a couple of commands that you go through that, that basically take uh, the output from ob object marker, which is like a vector file, uh, and then you feed it into this uh, OpenCV HAR training uh, program, which is actually what does the, uh, the machine learning. So, uh, so this is uh, just going to be a quick demo of, uh, of what I've got here. So let me bring over a terminal screen. Okay. And so what I'm going to run here is that object marker uh, program. And I'm going to generate this, this uh, vector type file, positive uh, description.txt, with a directory that I have, in this case, just a, a handful of images uh, that have the, um, have the object in it. So what you see is uh, this little, this is the foam fish object that I'm referring to. So you go, you draw a box around it, you try to make it as accurate as possible, and you move on. And what you're trying to do is you're, you're taking photos, especially of the object in different contexts, different backgrounds, uh, so that you can get uh, as much information about this as possible. So you might you say, take the object and put it on your spouse's head, um, or like in you know low contrast types of backgrounds and so on and so forth on the barbecue grill. It was lots of fun walking around and taking this little fish thing and trying to take photos of it everywhere. Um, and if you are doing things that are more common, such as you're doing trying to do facial recognition, which is a really popular thing to do with OpenCV, there are pre-created uh, databases of information that, of this hard classification that you can ma make use of. Uh, it's, you have to go through this, this effort, generally, if you're trying to identify an object that, you know, that doesn't have such a, a wide audience of people uh, making use of it. So if we take a look now um, on positive descriptions, you'll see that we have uh, basically these are, are vector files that describe where in that image the coordinates of the rectangle that you know, we created. Uh, and that can be fed into later steps uh, along the way. And then as far as the, uh, the explanation of HAR, that there's a guy on YouTube who did a much better job at it than I did. So let me put this right here. It's not quite big enough to, come on. There we go. And uh, let's see if I can grab the microphone and make sure you can hear the audio from this. In order to conduct face detection, we chose HAR object detection as opposed to other methods like SIPs due to its reliability and speed. 
Our object detection acts as a funnel, wherein every region of an image is analyzed using a set of classifiers called hard features that act as a funnel called a hard cascade. The classifiers at the top of the cascade are extremely fast and have extremely low false negative rates to immediately remove regions of an image that do not contain a face. The hard features become more and more complex further down the cascade as an optimization. Images are rejected as soon as possible if their features do not resemble a face. The HAR object detector works by calculating an integral image of a grayscale image. Similar to an integral of a function in calculus, every pixel of an integral image contains the sum of the intensities of every pixel above it and to its left in the original image, allowing the average intensity of any rectangular portion of an image to be obtained by accessing only four pixel values rather than hundreds at a time. A HAR object detector takes advantage of three different types of rectangular features, edges, lines, and combinations of four rectangles in order to detect a single object. A HAR object detector defines thousands of these rectangular features in different regions and combines these features in order to define an object and detect it efficiently. Each of these features is recognized extremely quickly in an integral image. Since thousands of features are verified thousands of times for every single frame of video, the integral image of a frame allows the software to be much more efficient by effectively calculating the image's intensities in advance. For face detection specifically, we used an XML file containing a cascade with thousands of rectangular features that are present in the face. For example, the cascade contained definitions for the cheeks being brighter than the eye socket, the nose being brighter than the eye socket, and the forehead being one of the brightest portions of the face overall. Thousands of these comparisons are conducted in real time to ensure that a single region of a single frame of video contains a face. So I don't know if the, the audio came through too well on that or not, but I, I felt like he gave a much better explanation than I could have at this point. So I'd like to thank uh, Varun Ramesh for that video. And that gives you a little education on uh, HAR object detection. Okay, well actually, why don't I give you a demo. Uh, so I, like I said, I didn't have the, uh, the robot arm working here and I apologize for that. I do have a video I can show you though of uh, the robot actually working. So this is in a, a hotel room earlier this year. So I've got this kind of blue placement, placemat back, uh, background down, which is kind of like a, the back of an air aquarium, you know, aquarium wallpaper. So we've got, that's kind of water and that's the fish in the water. And I've got the minnow board set up there uh, and we're running the, it's kind of hard to see, the minnow board fish picker upper code, which uh, is on GitHub. I'll share a link with that at the end. And you see the robot arm is looking for it, and that red box around the fish object is OpenCV's object detection saying, okay, we've detected this object. And it'll zero in on it using smaller movements and then reach down and, and try to pick it up. And then it goes and drops it off in the plate there, or the bowl. So again, it's in in one sense, it's a really simple thing, but you know, like a, a kid learning how to do this. I mean, you know, kids love robots to begin with. Uh, to be able to control them and give them like autonomous, you know, capabilities such as this is pretty exciting. So. That was the goal of the project, is to try to enable uh, this kind of uh, excitement that you can get around autonomously controlled uh, robots that can see. So there you go. All right, let's see if I can start the slideshow at the right slide. Yes, okay. So um, OpenCV obviously isn't the only way that you can do computer vision. And I just wanted to mention briefly that there, there are other methods. So I, I talked a little bit about the fact that the, um, using the OpenCV with the web camera can be a little bit sensitive to lighting conditions. Uh, one of the alternatives you could use is something like a Microsoft Connect, which actually uses infrared uh, to do its, its uh, vision uh, control. And the infrared is, uh, uh, the, the amount of light in the room is irrelevant to that. Uh, and one example of a, a robot 
that you can make use of is something called the TurtleBot, which is made of pretty commodity parts as well. So it actually uses a kind of a Roomba as its base. They actually sell Roombas that don't actually vacuum, but are just can be used as kind of robot experimenter kits. Uh, and then it's got the Microsoft Connect up there as a, as a its, its computer vision. And so it's got a whole platform. It uses, I think, the robot operating system that you can make use of uh, to control this. And you could put either like a netbook or a, you know, a minnow board or some little embedded board in there to, uh, to actually control it. So that's an alternative uh, thing here. So uh, one of the other purposes of this project was to use it for uh, advocacy of the Octo project. And so while you can uh, use the Angstrom distribution and you can install OpenCV and the dependencies that this thing requires, uh, I wanted to briefly go over to how you would enable this kind of uh, application using the Octo project. Uh, so basically, you needed to uh, you know, grab the uh, Octo project release and its uh, metadata there. And you'll find that you don't have certain programs that you need. So for example, OpenCV. And OpenCV has a number of dependencies, such as libav. Uh, if you're using the web camera, you want video for Linux uh, utilities and so on. Uh, but if you look around, when you're in this situation uh, with, with uh, the OE core layer, you don't have the software you need. You don't necessarily have to jump in and start writing your own recipes yourself. Uh, so it turns out that the meta open embedded repository had uh, just about all the recipes that we needed. Uh, we were able to grab the recipes from there and create our own layer based on that. So uh, the layer uh, name I gave it this was uh, meta robot open CV demo. Uh, and I created an image recipe that basically just booted up to X and gave me a, a terminal window and that included all the required OpenCV stuff. Uh, and there's a website you can go to uh, that I believe it's layers.openembedded.org, which is a, a, a searchable index of all the different layers you can get uh, for open embedded you know, Yocto project layers, basically. And so you can enter in the name of a recipe that you're looking for, and it will return you know, where you can find that. So that's a really handy tool to use when you're trying to grab some of these other uh, recipes. So what is, a, uh, what is a Yocto project? What is an OE layer? Uh, basically, it's, it has a directory structure here where you need a uh, configuration file. This is your layer.conf file. And uh, that will take, uh, tell the BitBake tool where you can find the remaining recipes in your layer. That's kind of like a, a boilerplate that you would make use of. Uh, and then you have uh, a recipes uh, subdirectory. And then you have the different uh, you know, uh, applications that you need in, into it, and you would put the, the recipe for swig or recipes for swig within the swig directory um, and enable that in your uh, build uh, bblayers.comp file. You would, you would point to both the, your OE core base layer and then this layer and then the, the BSP layer for the machine that you're building for, et cetera. Uh, and to show you what a, an image recipe looks like uh, in, in Open Embedded, uh, we have uh, this robot OpenCV demo image, uh, .bb. Uh, and it's pretty basic. We've got uh, a description. We have something called image features. And so uh, the, you know, what's going to bring in most of this is uh, X11 base will bring in every, all, the depend, all the sub-dependencies you need to get to a working uh, Xorg based system. Uh, and I just added a couple other things, you know, splash screen, the drop air SSH server, and so on. Uh, and uh, then we uh, append uh, here an image install. We can add the additional specific packages that we want to uh, have for this. So OpenCV apps. Um, there was a, a calibration utility that I used for con manually controlling the robot arm that uses WX Python. So I wanted to include that as well. Um, I think I threw Mesa demos in there uh, just to do some benchmarking. Um, and, and so that's an example of you know, how quickly you can you know, write an image recipe uh, for the Octo project. So I've been working on this. I think I got this first working for Linux Fest Northwest uh, in April of this year. And I've been kind of developing it and adding more to it uh, as time went on. Uh, and there are some other things I'd still love to do with this. Uh, the code for this is basically a big state machine, uh, but I'm not using any Python state machine libraries. So it would probably make the code a little bit more ma maintainable if I migrated over to a Python uh, state machine library. Um, one of the ways you could improve the reliability of the system would also be to increase the number of samples uh, that are used for the OpenCV training. Uh, one thing I've been wanting to do too, so you know, the middle board has a number of GPIO headers that you can connect to, and I thought it would be really cool to have it um, detect a fish by color so that you could have like, you know, some push button switches attached to it, and you could pick whether you want it to pick up the green fish or the blue fish or the yellow fish. Uh, and then have the, uh, you know, the, the program uh, be able to do that. 
Uh, and then, and then, like I said, the, the control of it via some of the GPIO buttons. Uh, some resources I've got here. So uh, information about the Minnow board, the Octo project. This is a link uh, to the, um, the actual specific model of that robot arm you can get. Uh, some stuff about OpenCV, a link to that video that we watched. And most importantly, if you want to actually take a look at the code that's running this, as well as the Yocto project layers that you make use of, uh, you go to github.com slash minnowboard. We have our own organization. You'll find um, some repositories uh, for that stuff, too. So really, I mean, that was, what, uh, half an hour worth of, worth of speaking here. I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions uh, people may have about this kind of thing. Yes? You didn't recognize the bowl on the way back. You just knew where it was. True. Yeah, that would be something else you could do. You could add some more object detection um, capabilities with, with recognizing the bowl. And then you could have the bowl in arbitrary locations. Yep. Yeah, it, it's because it's just two dimensional. And again, because I'm only using that one uh, axis of rotation, what I did was on, you couldn't see it on the blue place map, but I just had a couple of dots set out that were a six inch radius from the base. So as long as it's along that six inch radius, it should be able to, to pick it up. Yeah. What is the CPU utilization of the board running the demo? So it depends on uh, how fast you want the frame rate to be. Uh, it turns out one of the things that's the most computationally intensive with this is actually just uh, getting the, uh, the, the frames from the, um, from the web camera itself. I think I was getting, I think I settled on uh, about five frames per second I wanted to get. And uh, by contrast, so I, I tried running this on a Raspberry Pi and it was really choppy. It was actually barely usable at that point. So, you know, you'll see some performance differences between Minnow and, and some of the other platforms and that we're making use of definitely the CPU. But the actual OpenCV detection wasn't especially Hi, it might, I might have only been using 40 or 50% of the CPU for that aspect of it. And uh, if you do want to replicate this on another board, uh, in the code I include some comments that identify the parts where you, would, you can slow down the frame rate to, uh, to, to make it more usable for you know, lower performing uh, options. Yep. Uh, back there first. Um, can you do filters in OpenCV where you could just chop it down to maybe one color so yes yeah that would actually probably be a more reliable way and a simpler way of doing this um, and the reason I didn't do that it was again because I wanted to get into this whole uh, concept of teaching people to use something complicated like object detection uh, and uh, object and because of the object detection too you can even bring in the whole idea of like you're using artificial intelligence a machine learning algorithm to get this to work so that was part of the story behind this but that would be another way that you could go about doing this certainly Yes, there's a question here. I'm curious. Use Python for most of the implementation. Yes. Uh, and it's not... OpenCV li library internally, how is that, how is that structured? How, what, is that, what is used over there to actually implement functionality? So it's, uh, it's pretty simple. Like the script that's really controlling this is I think around only 400 lines of Python itself. So what you do is you use OpenCV to open up the, um, the web camera device that you're making use of. You're pulling frames from it. And then uh, you run code that uh, analyzes those frames using uh, the HAR uh, detection method, which you're pointing at the uh, database that you generated through those steps that I talked about, where you, you, do, you define the region of interest and then you, you uh, run that OpenCV HAR training mm -hmm. command. And what that outputs is uh, kind of a directory structure that acts as a database of sorts. So you need to, to um, be pulling in images and then pointing the Python code to that, uh, that database. Right, and then what it does is uh, when it identifies the object, uh, you can get a, a, a function that returns, and what it returns is the coordinates of the box that it's drawing around it, and then I have to figure out what is the center within that box. Right, yep, exactly. Um, that that would probably be it might be possible in some ways. Uh, there's some things you could do that would make it easier. If you had a camera that was looking at the robot arm, there are these uh, 
hatch patterns, I, I, there's a name for them, and I can forget what it is, that you can use that are actually really easy to identify with OpenCV. And you can put those on the axes that are rotating. And so you could do things like, you know, figure out what, uh, what the degree of rotation is, uh, making use of OpenCV again, but it would have to be kind of like a third party view of it, not necessarily something that, um, you know, has got a first person view out of it, I guess. Maybe, yeah. Of course, they simplify also the, cons the, the concept. Mm -hmm. to the sure, yeah. Yes? And this web camera, what kind of uh, image uh, format does it use? Is it JPEG or it's YUV? The, the oh, I think it's, uh, I, yeah, I think it's just a kind of a motion JPEG where I'm pulling the yeah. frames out of. So you have to decode it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Something that might have H two sixty four encoding built into it might be more efficient too. Yep. Anything else? All right. Well, like I said, uh, last session of the day. You know, definitely show up to the uh, the closing session, and uh, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.